Chapter Twenty One, The Panther and the Orangutan. Two formidable enemies stood before the pirates. One no less dangerous than the other, but it appeared that for the moment they had no desire to attack the two men. For instead of heading down the stream, they quickly advanced towards one another, intending to test each other's strength. The animal Sandokan had referred to as a harem bintang. Was a splendid panther of the Sunda, the other was an ape, a Maya's papan or orangutan, which in Malay literally means a primitive wild man, still plentiful in Borneo and the nearby islands, and feared for their incredible strength and ferocity. The panther was more than likely hungry, and seeing the ape pass on the opposite shore, had quickly jumped onto a large branch hanging over the stream, planning to use it as a bridge. It was a beautiful and dangerous beast, about the size of a small tiger. It had large, round head, short, strong legs, and a thick coat of dark yellow fur spotted with black rosettes. It must have measured a meter and a half in length, making it one of the largest of its kind. Its adversary was about the same size, with an enormous chest and strong, muscular arms more than two and a half meters long. Reddish-brown hair framed a large, wrinkled face marked by dark, sunken-in eyes, and a prominent mouth filled with sharp teeth. These apes live in the thickest part of the jungle, preferring the humid and lower regions. They spend most of their time in the trees, sleeping in spacious nests they fashion out of branches and leaves. They are more solitary than other apes and usually try to avoid contact with men and other animals. However, once threatened. They can become quite deadly, for few opponents can match their strength. At the sound of the panther's roar, the Mayas had come to a halt on the opposite shore of the stream, beneath a giant durian tree. It had been surprised just as it was about to climb up for fruit. Its eyes quickly fell upon the dangerous foe, taking in every detail, more in astonishment than in anger. It remained that way for several minutes, then it drew itself up to its full height. And bellowed darkly. The challenge had been accepted. It's going to be a terrible fight," said Yanez, not daring to move. "Thank God they aren't angry at us," replied Sandokan. "I was afraid they'd attack us." "Me too, little brother. Should we find another path?" Sandokan scanned the two banks, but quickly realized escape was impossible. Walls of trunks, leaves, thorns, roots, and vines enclosed both sides of the stream. They would have to draw their krises and start hacking away to open a path. We're stuck here, he said. They turn and attack us at the sound of our blades. Best not to move and hope they don't spot us. The battle should be over quickly. Then we'll have to face the victor. I doubt he'll be in any shape to put up much of a fight. It's about to start. The panther is getting impatient, and the Mayas can hardly wait to smash in its enemy's ribs. Load your rifle, Sandokan. Best be prepared. We'll shoot them both if need be. A deafening howl cut off his sentence. The battle had begun. Realizing the panther had no desire to leave its branch, the orangutan advanced menacingly, howling ferociously, pounding its chest in fury. Seeing it approach, the panther had crouched back as if preparing to pounce. However, it did not appear to be in any hurry to leave the branch. The orangutan gripped a large root with its foot, leaned over the stream, grabbed the branch beneath the panther, and with both hands shook it vigorously. The panther, despite having sunk its claws into the branch, could not hold on and fell into the stream. But no sooner had the feline touched the water than it jumped back up onto its perch. It paused for a minute, then pounced upon the orangutan, digging its claws deep into the shoulders and thighs of the ape. The orangutan howled in pain. Blood gushed from its wounds, running through its fur and dripping into the stream. Satisfied, the cunning panther drew back its claws, whirled about, and leaped off the ape's large chest, planning to retreat before its adversary could react. But as it landed on the branch, the orangutan lunged and grabbed it by the tail, thwarting its escape. Wild cries of pain tore through the air as the ape tightened its grip, refusing to let go. The poor panther," said Yanez, following the battle with great interest. "It doesn't stand much of a chance," said Sandokan. 
it won't escape from that deadly grip. The pirate had made an accurate prediction. Still clutching the tail, the orangutan jumped forward and climbed onto the branch. Gathering its strength, it grabbed the panther, spun it in the air, and hurled it into the trunk of an enormous durian tree. They heard a dry thud, then the unlucky beast rolled lifelessly into the dark waters of the stream. Its head, split open by that powerful blow, had spattered the trunk with blood. "'By Jupiter! What a shot!' murmured Yanez. "'I didn't think that ape would get rid of the panther so quickly.' "'They rarely lose,' replied Sandokan. "'Think there's any danger it'll attack us? "'It's angry enough to kill us both on sight. "'It seems to be in pretty bad shape. "'It's dripping blood everywhere. "'Could be misleading. "'My asses are incredibly strong. "'They've been known to live even after receiving several bullets in the chest. "'Shall we wait until it goes away? "'That might take a while. "'I think its nest is in that durian tree.' You can just catch a glimpse of it among those branches. Then we should retrace our steps. That'd cost us too much time. We'd have to make a huge detour, Yanez. Then I guess we'll have to shoot it if we plan to keep heading upstream. I had the same thought, said Sanokan. We're both good marksmen. We just need to get a little closer so we can get a clear shot. These branches could deflect our bullets. While they were preparing to attack the orangutan, the beast had crouched along the river bank and began splashing water over its wounds. The panther's powerful claws had sliced through the poor ape's skin, cutting it down to the bone. Blood gushed from its thighs, forming a small puddle on the ground. It moaned softly as it tended to its injuries, howling at times to voice its rage. Sanokan and Yanis had moved to the opposite shore, ready to dash into the jungle if their shots missed their mark. They had drawn up behind a large tree that stretched out over the stream and were bracing their arms against it to get better aim, when the Maya suddenly jumped to its feet and began beating its chest in fury. "'What's the matter with it?' asked Yanez. "'Do you think it's seen us?' "'No,' said Sanokan. "'It's going to fight, but not with us.' "'Another panther?' "'Shh! Something's moving in those bushes.' "'By Jupiter! Could it be the British?' "'Quiet, Yanez.' Sanokan silently climbed up onto the branch. Keeping himself hidden behind a curtain of rattan vines, he quickly scanned the opposite shore. Someone was approaching, cautiously advancing through the underbush. Unaware of the grave danger before him, he was heading right for the base of the durian tree. Alerted by the rustling of leaves, the orangutan had hidden behind the trunk, ready to pounce on its new foe. It had fallen silent, breathing heavily as it waited to attack. "'What's happening, Sandokan?' asked Yanez. "'The Maya senses something approaching. "'An animal or a man?' "'I'm not sure. "'What if it's just some unlucky Malai? "'We won't allow that ape to kill him. "'Wait! "'I think I just saw a hand. "'White or brown?' "'Brown, Yanez. "'Aim at the orangutan. "'I'm ready.' "'The ape howled darkly and rushed into a thick bush, "'ripping up branches and leaves with its powerful hands. "'Within seconds they exposed its prey.' A cry filled the air, then two shots thundered from the opposite shore. Sanokan and Yanez had fired. Struck in the back, the primate howled and turned about, spotted the two pirates, and immediately jumped into the stream. Sanokan had dropped his rifle and drawn his kris, ready to engage in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. Yanez had jumped onto the branch and was trying to reload. Despite its new injuries, the orangutan had rushed towards Sanokan. It was about to stretch out its hairy arms when a cry rang out from the opposite shore. The captain! A shot sounded. The orangutan stopped and clutched its head. It remained standing for an instant, glaring fiercely at Sanokan, then fell heavily into the water with a loud splash. Seconds later, the man, who by a hair had escaped the ape's wrath, rushed to the bank of the stream yelling, Captain! Senor Yanez! Glad I didn't miss! Yanez and Sanokan quickly leapt down from the branch. Paranoa! exclaimed the tiger happily. At your service, Captain, replied the Malai. What are you doing in the jungle? asked Sanokan. Looking for you, Captain. How did you know we'd be here? I spotted a few soldiers buzzing about the outskirts of the jungle with a pack of dogs. I knew you had to be in here somewhere. And you risk coming in here alone? asked Yanez. I'm not afraid of a few beasts. That Mayas almost tore you into little pieces. 
It hadn't caught me yet, Senor Yanez, and, as you saw, my bullet found its mark. Have the other prahus arrived? asked Sadakan. No, Captain. There still hasn't been any sign of them when I set out to look for you. When was that? the pirate asked anxiously. Yesterday morning. Could something have happened to the other ships? asked Yanez, his face showing signs of worry. The storm may have blown them far to the north, replied the tiger. Could be, Captain, said Paranoa. The wind was getting pretty strong. We were lucky enough to find shelter in a small, well-protected bay about sixty miles from here, and managed to make our way back fairly quickly. It's been more than a day. The other ships may have arrived while I've been searching for you. I still feel uneasy, Paranoa, said Sanokan. Let's hope we find them waiting for us. Did you lose any men during the storm? None, Captain. How's your ship? She suffered a little damage, but it's all been repaired. Is she hidden in the bay? I had her set sail to avoid any surprise attacks. You landed alone? Alone, Captain. Did you spot any British soldiers buzzing about the bay? No. However, as I said, I saw several coming the outskirts of this part of the jungle. When? This morning. Which way? East of us. It must have been coming from Lord James's villa, said Sandokan, looking at Yanez. Then, turning to Paranoa, he asked, Are we far from the bay? We won't get there before sunset. We're further than we thought, exclaimed Yanez. It's only two o'clock now. We still have a long way to go. Won't be easy to make our way through this jungle, Senor Yanez. It will be at least four hours before we reach its outskirts. Best get started, said Sanokan, barely stifling his impatience. In a hurry to get to the bay, little brother? Yes, Yanez, I have a terrible presentiment. If our ships aren't waiting in the bay, I'm afraid we may never see them again. By Jupiter! That would be a disaster! A terrible tragedy, Yanez, sighed Sanokan. It almost seems as if fate is against us, as if she's anxious to deal the tigers of Montpresem a last mortal blow. And if your tragic prediction comes true, what would we do then, Sandokan? What would we do? Do you think the Tiger of Malaysia would lose heart and bow to destiny? No, we'd continue the fight. Track down our enemy and give them a taste of our steel. We won't give up so easily. Think a minute. There are only forty men aboard our Brahu. There are forty Tigers, Yanez. Led by us, they perform miracles. No one will be able to stop them. You'd attack the villa? We'd even attack the fort in Victoria, if need be. I won't leave this island without Mariana Guianoc. Who knows, she may be the key to Montpresem's survival. Our lucky star will not burn for much longer. I can see it fading, but I'm not worried. Perhaps it'll shine stronger than ever. Ah, uh, if only she... Montpresem's fate is in her hands, Yanez. And yours, sighed the Portuguese. It's pointless to talk about it now. Come, let's try and reach the stream and see if our prahus have arrived. Yes, let's go, said Sandokan. With such reinforcements, we could take on all of Labuan. Guided by Paranoa, they ascended the stream and arrived at an old trail the Malai had discovered a few hours earlier. Plants and roots had overrun it. However, it was still traversable and the pirates made their way forward without too much difficulty. They advanced through the great forest for five hours, stopping from time to time for a short rest. Finally, at sunset, they arrived near the banks of the little stream. Not seeing any enemies, they headed west, crossing a small swamp that led to the sea. It had been dark for several hours by the time they reached the shores of the bay. Paranoa and Sandokan walked towards the reef to scan the horizon. See that, Captain? said Paranoa, pointing at a speck of light off in the distance that could easily have been mistaken for a star. Our Prahu? asked Sandokan. Yes, Captain. How do we signal her to approach? Light two fires on the beach, replied Paranoa. Best to signal her from the far end of this little peninsula, said Yanez. They made their way across the reef-strewn waters and soon reached the tip of a small wooded island. This is a good spot. The Prahu can approach without fear of running aground. Have her sail up the stream, said Sandokan. I want to hide her from the British. I'll take care of that, replied Yanez. We'll hide her in the swamp among the reeds. Once we remove her mast and rigging, we'll cover her with branches. Paranoa, light the signal. The Malai did not waste time. 
He gathered some dry wood on the outskirts of the small forest, made two piles and lit them. A moment later the pirates watched as one of the Prahu's white lanterns disappeared and was replaced by a red one. They saw us, said Paranoa. We can put out the fires. Have any of them been to the bay before? asked Sandokan. No, Captain. Then leave them be. They'll mark the way and guide them in. The two pirates sat on the beach, their eyes fixed on the red light as it changed direction. Ten minutes later the Prahu was within sight. Her immense sails were unfurled and they could hear the water slicing before her bow. She looked like a giant bird skimming over the waves. With two tacks she arrived before the bay, entered the canal and headed towards the mouth of the street. Yanez, Sanokan and Paranoa had abandoned the reef and were rapidly heading back to the edge of the little swamp. As soon as the Prahu dropped anchor near the thick reeds lining the bank, they climbed aboard. The crew were about to salute the two pirate captains with a roar of joy, but Sandokan quickly gestured for them to remain silent. Our enemies may not be far off, he said. Don't make a sound. We can't risk being discovered. That's an order. Then he turned to one of his men and with a slight tremble in his voice asked, The other two Prahus, have they arrived? No, Tiger of Malaysia, replied the pirate. After we left Paranoa, we sailed towards Borneo, and checked every shelter along the coast, but we didn't spot any of our ships. And you think? The pirate did not reply. He seemed hesitant. Speak your mind, said Sanukat. Tiger of Malaysia, I fear our ships did not survive the storm. Sanukat dug his nails into his chest. Fate! Fate! he murmured, shaken. The woman with the golden locks brings misfortune to the tigers of Montpresem. Be strong, little brother, said Yanez, resting a hand on his shoulder. We shouldn't despair just yet. The Prahus may have been driven off further than we expected, and been so badly damaged they could not take to sea. Until we find some debris, we can't assume they sank. Bah! We can't wait, Yanez. Who's to say if his lordship will remain in his villa much longer? I hope not, my friend. What do you mean, Yanez? Once he's out in the open, we'll set a trap for him and kidnap his beautiful niece. Attempt an ambush? Why not? Our tigers do not lack the courage, and even if his lordship's soldiers outnumbered us two to one, they would not hesitate to attack. Even as we speak, this clever little mind of mine is working on what's sure to be a brilliant plan. Let me rest tonight. Come tomorrow, we'll begin. I'm relying on you, Yanez. Rest easy, Sandokan. We should hide the Prahu immediately. She's too easy to spot by anyone venturing into the bay. I've thought of everything, Sandokan. I've already given Paranoa the appropriate instructions. Come, little brother, let's get something to eat. Then we'll go lie down. I must confess I'm starving and exhausted. While the pirates, under Paranoa's direction, were taking down the ship's rigging, Yanez and Sandokan went below and raided the food supplies. Once their hunger had been abated, they threw themselves onto their beds. The Portuguese, who could hardly remain awake, fell asleep almost instantly. Sandokan, however, had difficulty closing his eyes. Bleak thoughts and a sinister uneasiness kept him awake for hours. It was only towards dawn that he got some rest, but even that was short. By the time he stepped back on deck, the pirates had already finished their work. The ship had been pushed to the edge of the swamp among a thick cluster of reeds. The masts and rigging had been taken down, and the deck had been so skillfully covered with the piles of reeds, leaves, and branches, the entire vessel was hidden from sight. A passerby would have easily mistaken it for a grove of plants, or a large mound of leaves and branches swept there by the storm. "'What do you think, Sandokan asked Yanez who was already on the bridge, standing below an atap that had been erected on the stern. Excellent work, replied Sanokan. Now, come with me. Where? Ashore. I've assembled twenty men to go with us. All part of your plan, Yanez? You'll know soon enough. Men, lower the launch, mind the ship, and keep your eyes open. <laughs>